Welcome everybody. Today's guest is Richard Shell, the Thomas Gerardy Professor of Legal Studies, Business Ethics and Management at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Shell is the creator of Wharton's Popular Success Course and an author of four award-winning books on the art of negotiation, persuasion, and success, including the book Springboard, Launching Your Personal uh, Search for Success, we will talk about in today's episode. As a consultant, Professor Shell have advised over 100 business firms, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations, including Google, Johnson & Johnson, and the Crisis Negotiation Unit of FBI, as well as major universities, unions, hospitals, and foundations. As a scholar, Professor Shell publishes on the subjects of success, negotiation, dispute resolution, and strategy in leading journals such as the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. With that, Professor Shell, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Karina. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, um, as we were speaking off mic, um, it's like when I was preparing for this conversation, it's just fascinating to me that I haven't taken your class while at Wharton because I don't know, maybe I was too focused on others like dreams and kind of like assuming that I have the same dreams. So it would go like very hard into like financial modeling, like statistic classes, because I thought that's what I want to do, like be in private equity or any other like financial services institution. But now when I look back, it just your course, honestly, it has to be required for everyone at the University of Pennsylvania. And obviously I recommend everyone to read your book because I think when you don't have that North Star, that metaphor of success, what it may look for you and not for someone else, it's not easy to navigate through life because, you know, you think this will bring you fulfillment, you get there, you realize it's actually not even your goal to begin with, and then you feel lost. So that's why I think your course and the book and everything that you teach is so instrumental for everyone actually to be successful in their own way and have their own voice. And I think it would be great to start this conversation with a little bit of like backstory, why you decided to, you know, create this course and then publish a book and why this topic of success is important. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I think I when I wrote the book, I and I finished it, I thought to myself, I'm really grateful that I lived long enough to write it because it's the kind of work that you do a little later in your career when you, you know, have finished, you know, sort of achieving the things that, that you set out, one, me in this case, uh, and then you start looking back and thinking, okay, well, you know, my, my field is negotiation. That's the main thing that I'm actually uh, mostly known for. And so I'm, I've spent a long time teaching people how to achieve their goals, especially when it comes to working with other people, collaborating, negotiating, managing conflict, all that. And then I kind of went, well, but you know, the, the, the curriculum at Warden and, and most business schools uh, does a lot of work on tools, how to achieve things. Very little work on what goals are worth achieving. And at this point in my career, it was about 15 years ago, I thought, well, I've got something that I might be able to do to help with that. Um, and most I mean, success books are almost a cliche. Uh, you know, they're they're filled with first person stories. You know, I overcame great hardship. I went to the moon. I, you know, founded a company. I, I, I created Air Jordans. Whatever it is. And so look at me. And um, m my view of it was uh, much more. No, actually, what's important is to to help people look at themselves. And um, and so the, this book, and then of course on the other side of, of just egotism, which is what most How to Succeed books you know, surf on, there's self-indulgence, 
where you know you you tearfully confess all of your conflicts and your vulnerabilities and uh and then you know that's very gratifying for the writer or the speaker and sometimes people relate to that because if the speaker is famous or something they go oh this person has uncertainties too uh, but it can also be kind of maudlin and you know not really that helpful so so i kind of walk this little tightrope uh, between egotism and self-indulgence uh, to try to create this book with exercises uh, with puzzles questions that the reader and and when i teach the course my students can use as kind of diagnostic introspection investigations to help them discover what their own unique individual talents are, what their passions were. I mean, I actually think most people will have more luck finding their passions if they look back on their sort of eight-year-old self than they yeah. will by by reading a lot of media about celebrities and going, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I help people look back in order to go forward. Uh, and uh, so the, the motivation was really um, a kind of um, trying to be helpful uh, with, uh, without imposing myself too much on the helpfulness. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had, it, actually, since you, uh, while you were at Warden, but uh, you may have missed this, but just recently we achieved a benchmark. So in the MBA division, we have a program now called P3, uh, principles, yeah, pur that. principles, Purpose, and Passions. And it's run through our McNulty Leadership uh, Office now. But it was started by students, and over half the class now is involved in this. It's a voluntary uh, six-week program, uh, three hours a week. We put together groups of six or seven MBA students at random. They all they mm -hmm. all sign up. And then they read bits and pieces of Springboard, do the exercises, and then talk to each other about their lives, their families, the pressures they're feeling, the goals that they're not uh, as certain about now as they might have been before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a chance. There's so many talented students at Warden, but the opportunity for them to actually get past the surface of of the program and the culture because everybody looks at everybody else in a high performance culture like Wharton and sure. they figure everybody else has figured this out. You know, <laughs> I'm the only one that doesn't know. And I so one of those people. Yeah. So you don't know. So, so there's this um, collective ignorance of the fact that everybody's uncertain in some degree, some, a lot more. And this, this program and the book gives them an opportunity, not in a course, not where I'm teaching or anything, but just actually their mm -hmm. peer coaching. And that, that also brings a lot more credibility to their conversations, I think, because no one's saying here, you have to talk about this and you're getting a grade. Um, and, you know, I, my goal, actually my goal uh, for that program uh, was to try to help transform the culture at Wharton because it, mm -hmm. it's very impersonal in some ways. It's a big program and, um, and the students really don't get a chance to get to know each other in a meaningful way. Uh, very often, and a personal development agenda, a kind of w willingness to admit that you don't have all the answers, I think is a foundation of authentic leadership when you get further up the road. Uh, and so giving them a chance to experience that and practice telling their stories, uh, you know, uh, connecting the dots, uh, where we have 45% are from other non-U.S. countries. Culture yeah. plays a huge role in what your goals might be. And they get a chance to talk about pressures they might have experienced with their families or um, assumptions that they're now questioning. And try to get their own navigational devices operational. Uh, to uh, And those those navigational devices come in handy not just when you're transitioning out of a graduate school program, mm -hmm. they, they come in handy when you get laid off and you have to find a new job or they get handy when you're, uh, you know, decide you don't really like whatever it is you're doing because your boss turned into a monster or, uh, or you're going to retire and you, and you have mm -hmm. to look again at who you are and what you can contribute. So, so it's a good, it's a good practice run at a problem that's going to crop up 
through everyone's professional and personal life. Yeah, definitely. I think even reflecting on my time at Wharton, if I would first take your course or being part of the like program you just described, and then first ask myself what I want to do, and then choose elective courses based on what I want from life rather than looking at everyone else and following their path. It would be such a big difference like in my professional life as well. And it's interesting that you've mentioned about people being laid off or they just reevaluating their career choices. Like now is definitely not an easy environment in terms of the market in general and I know a lot of people who were laid off from work and it's really difficult but also I find that when you go through challenges like this you have this opportunity to pause and question like okay is it actually a career that you want to pursue and reflect on your own ideas of success but it's extremely painful for sure. Oh, it's, it's very, it's very, you know, high performance people, it's, you know, especially in their, say, between the ages of 21 and 45 or so, sort of between college and marriage and children, you know, uh, they have been achieving other people's goals for their whole lives. Uh, they were high performing students. Uh, well, they weren't intrinsically interested in necessarily in acing uh, standardized test, but they were drilled in how to make, uh, you know, time tests work so that they came out at the top. And they get used to basically being rewarded for things they're good at. And they never ask the question, do I like what I'm doing? Is there is there some energy I'm getting from this as opposed to energy mm -hmm. I'm spending on it? And so there's a bit of a trap in this uh, sort of achievement culture where that question is not presented. Now, that's, that's, it's not universally not presented. There are certain educational systems like the Montessori school system, the, the theory behind the Montessori schools, for example, where even kids when they're in daycare or you know, kindergarten, this sort of early education, Maria Montessori had a wonderful insight. She said, the job of the teacher is to get out of the way. And mm -hmm. so a Montessori school uh, is, uh, a whole set of very carefully crafted activities and and things you can work with and constructions you can make and so on that fill a room and then they put the kid in there uh all the kids and then they w wander around and find the things that they like to do and the and the teachers are there to help them once they get interested in something as opposed to saying okay everybody get their blocks out now and we're going to build a block and the one who gets the tallest block is going to get a prize, mm -hmm. which is the usual way that most education works. So it isn't that this this sort of use exploration as the tool and help people, you know, find ways that you can find people that will help you on your journey because you are exploring. Um, uh, it's there. It's just a very much a minority process. Uh, and eventually, I have a theory, eventually, sooner or later, everybody has to pivot to an inside-out perspective on their lives. Mm -hmm. And and the later it happens, the more there's a crisis, the more yeah. that they end up in depression or alcoholism or they lose a marriage or they have some sort of falling apart because they have no tools to pick up the pieces when they all fall apart. Exactly. I feel like when you reach that success, which is defined by someone else, and then you realize that you don't feel happy, you don't feel fulfilled, then you start to sabotage your own success. And as you said, pursuing maybe things you don't need to pursue, like alcohol or any other bad habits. But I also find, you know, like, when you have an idea of what success may look f like for you, but then how do you know that you're right? Oh, well, Not no one like ever that. knows they're right. That's that's part of the problem. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the way I try to conceptualize it uh, is this word success is a very powerful word. 
And Western culture in particular has this obsession. We, we celebrate, quote, successful people. But, but when you actually, and this is what motivated me at the very beginning to kind of figure this out, when you actually take a box and label it success and you open it and look inside, what you find is that there, there's two boxes already, there's two new boxes inside that box. And one box is called the outer life and the other box is called the inner life. And and so you have to open two more boxes before you can really make any progress on this. And most most people associate the word success only with the outer box. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's it's uh, having a hundred thousand Instagram followers, or it's being written up for some recognition, or it's you know being famous in some way, and uh, and 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 getting an award for something or whatever. All that's fine. I don't disrespect it at all. I'm a Wharton professor. I love being a Wharton professor. I'm mm -hmm. talking to you because I'm a Wharton professor. But the um, but the but the outer box is only one of the boxes. So th so when you have an obsession with the outer box and you don't open the inner box, that's when you end up in a bad place internally because mm -hmm. you've looked you you've been pursuing recognition but you've forgotten about respect. Now, yeah. recognition is a lot of people knowing a little bit about you, most of which may be false. And respect is a few people knowing a lot about you, most of which is true. And oh, wow. So, so the inner box is all about that stuff. And so you need to open that one too and look inside and go, well, um, career is an outer box, but meaningful work is the inner box. Mm -hmm. And and so part of the job I think everyone has is to realize they've got to open both boxes. And it's not all inner box either, you know, some recognition, some uh, some ability to have influence on others because you have credibility and other people have some reason to listen to what you're saying, that's outer box stuff. Um, because you can't be respected by very many people. Most people don't know you well enough to really give you genuine mm -hmm. respect. Uh, but it's both. And I think the work then becomes, well, which of these has been my focus? I need to add some from the other in terms of what the goals are I set and how I measure my own progress in life, and um, and and then 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 things begin to make more sense. But then, what to do if you know you start doing this exercise and you realize that you know all those outer achievements are there, but it's not aligned with you know your inner sense of fulfillment. And it's not like it's close enough, but it's like completely different things than yeah. how to make a change. That's a crisis. That's a crisis. Uh, and it, it's a crisis I know very well because I went through one myself. I did it at an early age involuntarily, but I was raised in a military family and I had military career in front of me. I had values from having lived on military bases all my life. My grandparents were both in the military. My, parent, my dad was a general in the Marine Corps. And... And in my 20s, uh, late in college, I was confronted with um, the choice about the Vietnam War. Uh, in you know, That was my personal crisis. And I had signed up to be in the military. I was on a Navy scholarship. And I had through, um, in a very short time, determined what my values really were about following my parents uh, and grandparents, my family traditions. And I realized I had to break with them. I had to completely break with them because it was an either or moment for me. Either I broke with them or I went to Vietnam and became a, a warrior killing people I had no quarrel with. And so I did break with them completely. Now, it, it, I, it's very painful when you have that kind of moment. It's very lonely. Um, you, you, you have to sort of rebuild your capacities and capabilities to have self-confidence when mm -hmm. you're not getting a lot of rewards for the old things that worked. I mean, everybody was going to be perfectly happy if I was going into the Marine Corps, uh, except. <laughs> <laughs> except me. Yeah. And it, it wasn't just that I was kind of not suited for it. It was, I, it was going to violate my moral sense of self to do mm -hmm. it. Uh, so there was a it was a non-negotiable item. But I think when you when you find yourself at those sort of crisis moments, that's when 
you know, it helps to be able to talk to other people. Uh, it helps to reach out and not be doing it alone. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, scour your network for uh, people who are in your life, but who are more like mentors than people who are judging you. Uh, and and consult with them um, and regain your sense of of, of self-efficacy. You know, I'm pretty good at writing or I'm pretty good mm -hmm. at uh, uh, working with clients or I'm pretty good at, um, you know, being uh, able to manage chaos or whatever the thing is that you actually are pretty good at that maybe the other career would have asked you to do. But now you can pivot the direction and the purpose and the implementation of it with a kind of sense of I'm, 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 I'm good enough at this so that I think I have a reasonable chance of contributing. And then it's, you know, you have to start at the bottom again somewhere. Mm -hmm. Not, not a happy place, but I didn't start as a professor at Warden until I was 37. That was my first day as a junior beginning professor was when I was 37. And, you know, everybody, who's at Wharton on the faculty, by the time they're 37, they're an associate professor. You know, they've, they've, they've gotten their PhDs, they're promoted, they're, you know, I was just beginning. So it's never too late to be doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to and worked with a lot of adults, uh, executives who are pivoting, students. I mean, I have one, one, one student who um, was in healthcare, in the healthcare program at Wharton. And she was, destined for consulting uh, in healthcare. It's a pretty, uh, you know, great business to be in. And, sure. but she realized through the coursework that we did that actually what moved her was healing. That's mm -hmm. why she was interested in healthcare. And, and she realized that it, for her, it was tactile. She really got this feeling of being fulfilled when she was able to touch the people she was helping. Wow. So she actually went into consulting. I got a letter from her a couple of years later saying, you know, I figured out I want to be a nurse. Will you write a letter of recommendation for me to go to nursing school? And I said, of course. She'd written her final paper on success talking about this. I knew exactly why she was getting there. And so she, she went back to school, redid two years of an undergraduate degree, and an extra year of a master's degree in nursing. And and she's now an emergency room nurse in New York City. Uh, and she's, of course, a pretty bright person and a Wharton degree to boot. So, you know, I'm pretty sure before it's all over for her, she's going to end up running a hospital or a health system. Mm -hmm. uh, but she'll be doing it with a lot more context and a lot more knowledge and a lot more passion than she would have had she done that same route gotten to the same outcome and just on consulting. Wow, that's a very inspiring story because, you know, the person who already has so many years of education and then like taking a step back, which is not actually a step back, but you're just like kind of removing yourself, reevaluating and committing again, like for another several years of education, but pursuing your passion. It's really inspiring because like I have conversation with my classmates and let's say they do consulting or something else and they want to do completely different things. And then the question is like, well, I already have all those degrees. Then it's going to like for the work that I want to pursue, you don't even need to have those degrees. So like, is it a waste of time for me? Like it's kind of like because you already have the past and you feel like, it doesn't make sense to do something you could have done before accumulating those degrees. You, you tell yourself it's too late. So, you know, you went to business school. Do you remember sure. the concept of sunk cost? Oh, yeah. So a sunk cost is, is making bad business decisions because you've already made bad business decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so you're unwilling to abandon the plant that is no longer producing anything that makes any money because you spent a lot of money on it. Uh, yeah. and, and same thing for, for your life. Uh, if you spend all your time justifying your past by continuing to do something that gives you no joy or satisfaction, 
uh, you know, what, what's going to happen someday when you're like lying in bed and you're wondering, what was that about? Uh, it's never too late, never, never too late uh, to uh, reinvest in yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to get a degree. I mean, that's that's that sometimes professions require those degrees. I, I went when I went to law school, you know, before I came to Wharton, that was sort of uh, my professional path was I didn't really want to be a lawyer, but I needed a job and I was good with words. So I followed my talents into law school. But I was in law school with a 45 year old guy who was a former regulator at the Federal Communications Commission. And he just had a regular undergrad degree, but he decided, you know, he'd work with enough lawyers that he really liked what they did. And he was excited by the prospect at 42 of going back to graduate school. Mm -hmm. He had a family. I mean, it wasn't easy. Uh, and getting a law degree so that he could, you know, play a different role. And in his mind, a more interesting one and a more mm -hmm. uh, sort of important one in this field that he was already in. And so... He just stepped back and reinvested it himself and went on to be a really uh, important guy in communications law. So uh, it's never too late. It takes some, it takes some sacrifice. Uh, you ha it helps to have a foundation of financial security somewhere that you can rely on somewhere. Um, I've got in my course that I'm teaching right now at Wharton on responsibility in business, it's a, I'm finishing up the class uh, today. I've got a former Navy SEAL uh, I've got a former Marine intelligence officer. Uh, these are people who are completely changing their lives. Uh, you know, they went. one went to the Naval Academy. Uh, you know, these are people who the military was their career. And then they decided, okay, I'm really not, um, I'm not going to make this what I do for the rest of my life. What am I going to do? And so they're reinvesting in themselves and pivoting to a whole new, it takes a lot of courage. They have children, they have families. One commutes from Virginia Beach, that SEAL does. Um, so, so yeah, um, you know, they have support systems, but they're the ones who hard, have made the big decision, you know, jump. Take a leap of faith, right? <laughs> exactly. Faith in yourself. It helped, but I, I, I'll say it again. It, you ha if you're going to have... You're going to make a move like that. You have to have people who have faith in you. And you have what to have you, them around you. What if you don't have this type of people except you, your family, like mother, like your parents? So. Well, I mean, let's not discount parents. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, uh, mean, but, I mean, I, they, you know, if they were the ones who were driving you to be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, a uh, 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 whatever, then that may be a problem. But chances are most parents actually want you to have a satisfying life. That's what most parents really want. So don't discount. I ended up after a fair crisis, I ended up living with my parents when I was 27 and 28 years old in the basement. They, they, they were very supportive of me as I found my way. Uh, but, but I think it, I, one of my exercises in the class is go back, think of a coach, in sports, a mentor, uh, an elementary school teacher, um, someone who inspired you along the mm -hmm. way and who, who, who sparked your interest in whatever it was at the time. Um, go back and reach out to them and say, you know, I'm at an interesting place in my life. I, you were very important part of my life. Uh, you may not have known it, but you were, and here's why. And I wonder if we can have a conversation. Uh, and I think you might be able to help me. Do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I would say two kinds of conversations, the look back ones, and you find there are a lot more supporters back there than you probably realize. Mm -hmm. And then the look forward ones. And that is when you're pivoting, sit down, imagine the perfect work, whatever it is, the perfect combination of things and you go, wow, if I could be doing that, now that would be, you know, that would be pretty cool. And, and what you need to do is find some people who are already doing it and call them and say, could I have 15 minutes of your time just to find out how you got there? So look back, talk to people, look forward, find people, talk to people. People love to talk about themselves. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> Do you have a favorite metaphor for success? 
Well, for myself, I do. But I think everybody has an interesting, you know, some people are verbal, some people are visual, some people are, mm. you know, different, different senses are kind of the key to people's perceptions. And so I like to think, for some people, a definition of success is what they need. Uh, I have a story in Springboard that I tell about a guy who showed up at a seminar and uh, it was a working One of my man. Favorite. Yeah, and and so you know he was at this seminar and they were talking about happiness and it was a research program and he was just an ordinary member of the public. But in the middle of the program, he he sort of asked a question. He said, "I don't understand what you're talking about. You're talking about happiness and money." You know, it was a big financial study about you know GDP and well-being, and he said. In my, the way I see it, happiness is just three things. Good health, meaningful work, and love. If you have that, that's, that's enough, isn't it? And so for him, verbally expressing it was the, the work. And he knows that when those three things are all happening at the same time, he has a reason to celebrate. You know, it, you know, you may have things come and go, but hey, there's moments when all three of those things are cooking at the same time. And let's be satisfied with that. We just, there's no need to be dissatisfied when you've got good health, meaningful work and love all happening at once. And then for other people, it's visual. Uh, I had a student or even physical. I had a student who whose most meaningful memory as a as a uh uh, at that time in his life was he'd spent some time in Central America helping children build, helping a community build a school for children that were in the community. And and he spent a whole summer doing it. And one of the children, when he was about to leave, gave him a little um, necklace, uh, like a, uh, a symbol of, of their community. It was a little... Uh, you know, image of one of the animals that was common to that area. And it was a little wood carving with a hole in it. And he put it around his neck. It became a kind of necklace. He always wore it for, you know, he was still wearing it when I met him because he said it helps him remember the direction he needs his life to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a physical manifestation. And then an image for myself, I, I, scoured the internet. Google Images is very handy this way because you can just surf and try to find something that resonates with your values. And for me, the image that I resonate with is a stone dropping in a still pond. And after it drops, there's these consent, these circles ripple out. And my sense of doing, I'm doing what I should be doing when I'm in a position where I am getting the chance to have positive influences on other people's lives and having had those positive influences, they have more capacity to have positive influences on the lives they touch. And it just, you know, it's a little good ripple effect. Uh, so that's not the only time that I'm happy, but I feel like my success values are embodied in mm -hmm. activities that result in that happening. So I'm teaching this afternoon. I'm going to be feeling good. I'm talking to you this morning. I'm feeling very good. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm doing what I know I should be doing. Oh, that's beautiful. I know that we are running out of time. Uh, but to close this conversation, I think the last question that I have is, do you have a piece of advice for the audience or like something you would like to share with them, like maybe some exercises to reflect on uh, uh, on their own journey or just in general, some advice for people who are trying to figure out what success means for them. Sure. Uh, well, that's a big, that's a big question. Uh, I, I can, I, the one simple resource I, on my own personal website, grichardshell.com, I have the exercise that's in chapter one of Springboard. It's called the Six Lives Exercise. And it's free. You can just click on it. You don't have to buy anything. Um, and that's a pretty good starter kit for kind of beginning to surface what some of your success values are. Because each of the lives I profile, there's six, and I ask you to put them in order from most successful to least. And they mm -hmm. all have some inner life and outer life stuff going on. And so it helps you to sort of figure out where 
the balance is for you and what the inner life part is and what the outer life part and the scale of it might need to be. So that's one thing people can do to kind of get the conversation started. I would say do that exercise and then get five friends to do that exercise and then have um, uh, a meeting in a in someone's apartment and talk about it. Brilliant. Talk about talk about what your top life was. Everybody's going to have different choices. It'll mm-hmm. give you a chance to begin the process of articulating who you are, why uh, your values are what they are, and maybe finding the areas where the next move would be a positive move in a good direction for you. So that that's a you know I I I I like to say the most important thing is take action. Mm-hmm. And uh, because it's like in hockey, ice hockey, no one scores unless they shoot at the goal. Uh, and sure. when you're shooting at the goal, you may not hit the goal, but good things happen when you're shooting at the goal. You're more likely to make a goal if you're shooting for it. Uh, so uh, so taking the six lives exercises and getting a group of people together to talk about it is some steps, some action steps. Mm-hmm. So, uh, So there's, you know, that's a thought. Yeah, I'll definitely link it into the show notes. Right. I've done this exercise, but I actually didn't do the second part, like meet with a few friends and discuss it. I'll definitely do it with a few of my classmates from Wharton. Yeah. Excellent. For sure. And Professor Shell, thank you so much for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule with teachings and everything. I really appreciate your perspective on success, your advice, and I have no doubt that the audience will find a lot of useful and helpful information in this episode, at least like to start them looking inside, like and see like what actually fulfills them, what success is. And as you said, it's important to take action. You cannot think your way into action You have to act and then thinking will come. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Take care.